Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next interview, my next hot docs interview is with Kalina Bertin and her, uh, she's here to talk about her new film, Manic, which is uh, premiering here at Hot Docs. And again, this is another film that you're going to need to see and you will probably make your judgment call on that after you've heard the interview or maybe gone online and read a little bit more about the film and, and about Kalina and so on and her story. But this is a film, once again, it's, it's about finding our way back home, it seems to me. This is a film about uh, mental health issues. This is a film about secrets. This is a film about family. This is a film about um, our, our past and how, how things get passed on. This is a story about why, you know, we need to be Again, we need to be talking about things. We need to be uh, creating a new conversation. We need to be creating a healthy conversation. We need to be creating something that's, you know, more intimate and open and and and, and more understanding. And and uh, Kalina talks about uh, about about a, a level of ignorance that she had when she started making this film that was uh, sort of. Um, what's the word I'm looking for here that was kind of eclipsed by her own prejudice. I mean, what a wonderful and wise, insightful thing to say. You're going to love the interview. You're going to love the film. It's called Manic. Uh, Kalina Bertin coming uh, right up. Don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about my podcasting, uh, about my speaking, and about my writing. There's there's lots of interviews there to choose from. Don't forget, too, you can help support what I do here at Face to Face through patreon.com and also rabble.ca for more uh, interviews. Coming up, a hot docs interview interview with Kalina Bertin about her new film, Manic. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are joined by another filmmaker today, another hot docs filmmaker here today uh, to talk about her new film, Manic. Uh, Kalina Bertin is here with us right now, live and in person. Kalina, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. So are you in town? Are you here ready to roll for hot docs? Absolutely. Yes, I'm having my premiere tonight. Sunday um, at 6.30 at the Scotiabank. Amazing. And it's going to show over the next week, of course. And then are you... Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and are you hoping to get a theatrical release, a release or have you, have you got any of that sorted out yet? Uh, not sorted out, but uh, I think it's definitely on the table. We're looking into nice. it. And um, yeah, it's just a matter of, uh, of time. Amazing. Well, first of all, congratulations. Congratulations on being here in Toronto at Hot Talks. Congratulations on your film. It's, it's, it's mesmerizing. It's, it's mysterious. It's, uh, it's, it's really disturbing on so many levels, but also really uh, intriguing as well. So, so thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the film without giving too much away uh, before we dive in? I've got, I've got lots of questions uh, to ask you. Well, absolutely. So uh, my film, Manic, um, essentially chronicles um, my struggle to make sense of the mental illness wreaking havoc over my siblings' lives and convinced that my father holds a key piece um, to um, understanding this mental illness. Uh, I sit down on a journey to sort of piece together his life, and I discover uh, a man alternately known as a cult leader, a scam artist, and a father of 15. So that's <laughs> that's that's a whole lot. We could go a whole lot of places with that, and and I think it's it's really it's really quite a remarkable reveal. I mean, I I kind of want to ask you about it as a filmmaker, but I kind of just want to ask you about it as you know, Kalina Bertin, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You yeah. know, because this is such a personal film. I mean, you're not you're not documenting something else or something other. This is you're documenting you. You're documenting your life. This has got to have been really difficult at times. Uh, absolutely. I kind of had to play two roles in this process. I was at once the daughter of uh, the subject and um, also the filmmaker. So I had to kind of reconcile those two, two roles. Um, it wasn't always easy. You know, I think there were some moments that were very, very hard, and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to, you know, continue and pull it together. But luckily I did. Um, and it was a very long process, but um, 
um, I think it kind of like shred me to pieces and rebuilt me. Mm. So um, it was quite il- illuminating. But um, I, but I think also sort of the intimate connection that I had to the subject uh, really helped uh, sort of uh, capture those very intimate and raw scenes that you can see throughout mm. the film. So so I'm re- I'm fascinated for so many reasons. But Kalina, so many people would would have an, I think anyway, I don't, maybe this is a sweeping generalization, but I would imagine a lot of people would have an opportunity to look into their past, to go this deep and would say, you know what? I don't really need to know. I'd, yeah. ra- I'd rather not know some of these details. I'm just going to live my life going forward from today on. In fact, I have a family member who uh, I had, a, I mean, at the timing of your film is really quite remarkable for me because just maybe two to three weeks ago, uh, I had quite an intimate conversation with someone in my family who just said, no, don't want to go there. Thanks. Oh, we, we need, yeah. yeah. And kind of heartbreaking on one level, right? And kind of, yeah. and, and kind of revealing on another. And yet at a certain point, you know, as I was driving away, I went, okay, I, I do have to come to terms with that. And I've got to respect that, right? At yeah. some point, I've got to respect that decision. But yet there was this sense of, Wow, why not? Why wouldn't you? Yeah, I, uh, yeah I absolutely understand you. And uh, so what you're describing, sort of like uh, wanting to uh, shut away the past, forget about, about the past, is very much the position that my mother had regarding mm. this whole story mm. because I grew up not really knowing who my father right. was. And, you know, when I was a child, I'd ask questions to my mother and she just would not want to talk about it. And that sort of was like a growing pain when I became a teen. And, you know, mm. during those years of crisis, you're trying to understand who you are and where you came from. And I felt like there was a huge void for me because not only I looked so much like my father, I didn't really know, you know, who he was. And I felt like I didn't know who I was. And um, so my mother's position was like, you, it's better that you don't know. But I just felt like sort of this veil of secrecy kind of enabled trauma to seep into our lives and to continue um, um, harming us. So I really felt like my father was continuing to live through us because of the secrecy of his life. And for me, to find healing, the only way was to kind of confront these questions and shed light on them and to really have a dialogue because there was no dialogue in my family. You know, the mental illness was kept a secret. Like when I was um, making this film, I discovered that my father had been uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and that probably uh, could explain why his life was so chaotic. And, um, but also, then I discovered that his own father had been diagnosed with manic depression, mm. bipolar disorder, mm. but it was all a secret. So, um, and I discovered that by interviewing my father's sister. And uh, so she said in the family they could not discuss uh, the mental illness of their father. And for my father, so that was passed on to my father. And, we, like, it was never discussed that my father was, you know, mentally ill. And if I, my mother had sat down with us and explained, listen, we have sort of this legacy of mental illness on your father's side, it's important to know that you may be vulnerable to this. And so you have to be careful. You know what I mean? Because my brother, he went out when he was about 18, and he started using, and that triggered the illness. Mm. So I felt like, because we didn't know, we didn't have the tools to kind of protect ourselves and to change this legacy. So, so tell me a little bit about that. The, I was going to ask you about the process of, of I'm really fascinated by your phrase, triggered the, uh, triggering the illness, because that brings up a lot of questions, I suppose, about, about the bipolar disorder. I had a friend who I studied philosophy with who... who who um, I had a couple of pretty, what I would call, I suppose, manic kind of experiences with him. And we had a great friendship over many, many years. And it was only till he stayed with me for about three days where I started to see things that I hadn't seen before. And, uh-huh. and, where, and where there was this level of intimacy, I suppose, that was, you know, developed between Danny and I. And, and, and I remember he, it's kind of comical in a way, but he flooded my apartment. And, okay. um, he was, he was, he was high at the time and I came home, it was late at night. And, and I just, I just remember going, wow, what, what is like, what is going on? What and, is happening? Yeah. yeah. What is happening here? Is this, is, 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 is this some kind of weird joke? Is he, you know, and really it was kind of my first sort of introduction. And, and then the next two years I was kind of drawn into his family and his life and so on. So you do that beautifully well. And I just, I, I marvel at how, how um how open you are you know uh, uh, with your family and with with your experience because i would imagine this is going to just i would hope blow the blow the conversation wide open yes well absolutely well like you were saying you know uh, it's um, 
bipolar disorder, which used to be known as manic, um, manic depression, mm-hmm. but it's the same thing, is this larger-than-life condition that is so hard to grasp and to understand. And I, throughout making this film, I realized that I knew nothing about mm-hmm. this condition. Mm-hmm. I only had mm-hmm. prejudice. Oh, that's pe- pretty interesting. That's a really and, wise thing, yeah, to say. Exactly, and most yeah. people actually do. And you know what the crazy thing is? Is as I was talking more and more about this film, I realized how so many people either have a loved one, or you know, um, a friend or a friend of a friend who suffers with bipolar disorder. So it's much more common than we would imagine. But it's something that we don't know about and that we're not talking about. So, 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 tell me again why you wanted to talk about it. Was this about healing for you? Was this about healing for your family? Was it about creating an opportunity for others to have a conversation? Maybe all of the above? Yeah, I'd say definitely all of the above. Um, but it started sort of in the personal because I realized that in my family, uh, well, first, so what comes with bi- uh, bipolar disorder often uh, when the person is first diagnosed is denial. So if it's kept a secret in the family and the, the person struggling with the disorder is in denial, then healing is almost impossible. So for me, when I was making the film and understanding more about the illness, that the illness, well, there's kind of different types of bipolar disorder, right? There's bipolar type 1, there's bipolar type, type 2, and then there's cyclothymia. So my siblings and in my family, um, what, what sort of we have is, is bipolar type 2, uh, in which you can experience psychosis. So there's different stages. There's like hypomania, mania, mm-hmm. psychosis, and depression. All this I learned throughout making the film. And once I understood those things, I could sort of try to guide my, 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 my loved ones, my siblings, and try to help them. So, okay, I could recognize the signs. Okay, right now, Francois, you're hypomanic. So you need to either take your meds or calm down, because if you don't, this is going to ex- escalate to mania. And that's when often, or worse, psychosis and that's when you go you end up in the hospital right and so you know and, but the more we talked the more my, my my siblings started to acknowledge yes i have this disorder yes it's scary because it's kind of a life sentence because it's not there's no cure to bipolar disorder you can take medications to find stability and live a healthy you know mm-hmm. somewhat normal life mm-hmm. but this is something that you will be struggling with throughout your whole life so that's why it's so hard to accept that you have it um, but throughout making the film and, and, and sort of filming them, and also I would show them kind of works in progress of the film so they could see uh, themselves from outside. So the, the, the camera was kind of like a window for them into their own world. And so that really helped them to try to find ways to heal. You know, at, at near the end of the film, <clears throat> Francois, I think it's Francois, uh, is talking about something that I just thought was really profound and, and kind of, um, I suppose, commiserating with, I think, your sister and you, the three of you, and making a joke about, you know, where have you gone? And, oh, yeah, right, you're behind the camera. Um, yeah. But he said something about people don't speak the same language that I speak. No one, no one yeah. really, no one really un- understands out there. And isn't that yeah. really what this film is all, isn't that what this conversation, this interview we're having right now is all about? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's this, the, trying to open up this isolation because for so long, like my family was just struggling in silence and we thought that we were alone, but we're not, you know, like so many people out there um, are ashamed of this illness that's controlling their lives, you know, it's but pretty... I want to show them. Yeah, no, it's real. It's fascinating that you use the word ashamed. So I've already done a few film, a uh, few interviews for for hot dogs this year, and and I think you know, I, I can shame continues this idea of shame and guilt and how it's impacting who we are, and how it's getting in the way of our ability to have, um, dare I can I say joyful relationships with others. You know, absolutely, it's not absolutely. allowing us to connect. It's not allowing yeah. us to re and connect's not even the right word because it sounds almost too, I don't know, digital or too technical. It's not relational enough, but, but it's not allowing us to, 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 I don't know, form, um, intimate community. There you go. How's that? Absolutely. I, I absolutely agree. And there was so much shame in my family because of my father's kind of chaotic life. And I think my mother felt a lot of shame. So that's why she was trying to conceal it. Uh, to, and, and so, and with the illness, also lots of shame that comes with that. And that's why I love so much. Like some people, you know, they ask me, oh, why did, why did you do this film? And mm-hmm. um, for me, the, the sort of the absolute ex- expression of why I decided to make this film, it really relies in that scene of when my sister is in her kitchen and she talks about how hard it is for her to go to welfare 
because mm. at this point she's lost her job because she had another psychotic episode. Right. But she has a daughter that she has to support. Yes. Yes. So she has. She talks about the shame and the guilt to have to go to ask for you know social assistance, welfare. But she says that as long as she'll be, she feels guilty and ashamed. She can't face this illness and 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 overcome it. You know, it's not her fault. It's like she, she's been dealt like a bad deck of cards. You know what I mean? Like, but but the only way is to face it head head on and to accept it. And and the shame does not help. Do you think? Do you think that the you know you talk about your family not wanting to talk about it? I mentioned that in my family. Um, and 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 boy, you wouldn't have to go very far in your community to find lots of people with lots of stories that don't want to talk about them. Uh, <clears throat> Do you think that that actually feeds into the mental health issues? That, you know, it certainly feeds into disconnection. It certainly feeds into, you know, uh, a, a, a lack of community. But what what about the mental health issues? Well, 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 definitely. The first step is obviously talking about it. And, and because that's how you can help your loved one. You know, there's also this scene where I, I, I tell my sister, you know, you have to tell me what's going on inside your mind. Right. So I can try to understand and I can try to help you. You know, oftentimes people struggling with mental illness because of their shame, they don't want to reach out or they feel like they're a burden, you know. But it's so, and it, often when it's, it's when the, peop, the person is suffering most, when they most need to communicate that they don't reach out. So yes, c- communication is so so essential in keeping the you know those loved ones alive. Like the rates of suicide with people um, who are struggling with mental health, but I know by reading the stats with bipolar disorder is extremely high. So yes, it's extremely important to keep the conversation on on the table because the thing is maybe you know I did this film and I'm trying to look for answers and solutions. I don't have like I don't have them all, right. but by sharing this film with the world, maybe it will touch other professionals, psychiatrists you know, nurses, mm-hmm. institutions, so they can start a dialogue, a dialogue amongst, amongst themselves and find, you know, also like concrete solutions as to how we can better communicate, how we can create more awareness towards this, you know, um, condition and, and create, you know, intervene earlier amongst mm-hmm. young ones mm-hmm. struggling and what can be done, you know, to help people with well, yeah, mental re- illness. Re- yeah. Re- yeah, recognizing it earlier so that, that it, you can have a better conversation about it, but also get, get better treatment and provide a, a better environment, a healthier environment, right? A more loving environment uh, yes, to, yeah. to, to foster, uh, you know, more intimate relationships, which you would like to think is going to lead towards healing. Uh, um, yeah. Tell me more about your brother's illness and how he triggered it. Now, you said by using, so yeah. I'm assuming some, you know, uh, 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 drugs of some kind or maybe alcohol, mixing medications, something along those lines. Yes. Well, well so I, I do believe that my brother sort of had mild symptoms of uh, bipolar disorder, but they were mild. So when he, uh, growing up, he, he kind of had his moods were, would fluctuate, mm. but, um, but I think he could have probably lived his whole life just by, you know, sort of navigating mildly through those ups and downs. But by, because he was using that really, what happened is that that triggered psychosis. And right. once you go through psychosis, that changes the brain. And the more you experience psychosis, the more your brain changes, mm. the harder it is to treat. So the medication doesn't work as well. Um, and that's something a lot of people don't know. And that's something I found out through the meetings that I went to with my brother, with his psychiatrist, and through, through, mm. re- through reading. And the thing also is that, you know, lots of um, teens, you know, when they turn around, you know, 13, or they start using. And, and they don't know that, you know, if they have a, a history of mental illness, uh, drugs can trigger uh, bipolar disorder, you know, cocaine, uh, pot. Uh, and even pot. Some people think that pot is, you know, <laughs> a milder drug, but it's so hard. The, 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 the degree of THC uh, in the pot that circulates on the street is extremely high and dangerous for people um, who are vulnerable to mental illness. And so in my brother's case, uh, it was a mixture of drugs, but I know that, that marijuana also like played a, a big role in sort of uh, triggering the psychosis. So can we then go to your father and, you know, he served Pearl Harbor, Korean War, torture, alcoholism, PTSD. How much do you think, I mean, this is some pretty, you know, he's got some pretty uh, horrific elements in his past. How much do you think that played into it? I mean, looking for not, you know, not wanting to point blame, but I suppose looking for some kind of understanding or, or, or sense of responsibility around how might things have been done differently. Yes, yes. Let me just clarify. So that was actually my, it was my grandfather. Oh, I'm sorry. Went, 
Sorry. Yeah. Yes. So it was my grandfather who went to Pearl Harbor to Korea, and actually. Um, so you're talking about so you're talking about transgenerational trauma. This is yes, yeah. transgenerational yeah. Yeah. trauma because I do believe. So yes, my grandfather he went to the war, and when he came back, he was diagnosed by the medical psychiatrist with bipolar disorder. But it, what happened is when he was in Korea, he was kind of. Um, he was ahead of I can't remember what the like the army term is, but he had he was I think I don't remember if it was a general, but he was ahead of a group and he got captured, hmm. and all of the people in the in the sort of the core were were killed unfortunately, and he survived. So he had survival guilt, and and hmm. so that hmm. trauma probably uh, triggered the illness, and then he became an alcoholic to try to sort of manage. The, the, the post-traumatic stress right. and, and his mental illness, which is very, very common among people dealing with bipolar sure. disorder, yep. is that they will go to, med- to recreational drugs uh, to self-medicate, which really isn't ideal because those drugs can, like I said, trigger psychosis and, and worsen depression. But so I do believe that my, my father grew up in extremely traumatic conditions because of so the psychotic episodes that his own father was going through. And, and because, like I was saying, like... It was secret. So in his family, they could not discuss the mental illness of their father, and they didn't even know. Like, my aunt right. fi- found out that my father was, that her father was manic depressive, like, after he died. Mm. So it was not discussed. So you grow up thinking that this chaos is, is normal, right? When yeah. It, yeah. And, and, and that creates very... Well, it makes you, it, it, you had to have at some point, and maybe quite often, wondered if if there had been a film like yours about somebody yeah. else's family, had there been more conversation, had they, there been less shame and, and this ability to be honest and open and authentic and, and transparent with one another, could have things been way different? Yeah, because then my father would have known that he was vulnerable to this mental illness. Right. And maybe he would have been more careful in the, in the kind of life that he, did, that he, he lived. You know, but because it was a secret, probably the first symptoms arrived and there was the denial, no, I'm not sick, I'm right. fine, and I'm, right. I'm not going to seek treatment, right? When he was diagnosed, um, you know, they, he took lithium for a very short amount of time and then went off it. So my father right. never seeked, like, a successful treatment plan, plan and essentially, like, sadly, um, he just created so much chaos and shattered so many lives. Um, but had he sought that treatment, you know, um, it just would have, you know, saved so many people. Well, you, you the, the, I believe the blurb on, on, on the hot dog site and, and in the press kit talks about, about your father. Well, actually, I think you referred to it right out of the gate on the interview, but a, a, pro- yeah. a prophet, a scam artist, a cult leader, father of 15 children worldwide. You, you, you watch your film and there's this sense... You know, at one point, you you know, I kind of went, wow, this is the kind of a story they should make a movie about. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And and yeah. it just, because you almost, it's almost hard to believe. Yeah. And it's, definitely. wow, this has, this has to be fictional, for crying yeah. out loud. There's no way that families are living with this kind of pain and brokenness and trauma. Yeah. And I think that's what's so remarkable about your film. And I, I so appreciate the fact that you... Uh, your, you know, your generosity and your, your, your willingness and ability to actually put it up there for all of us to see, I think is, is not only fascinating, I think it's, it's, uh, it's something we should all be working towards, you know, uh, daily conversation. I mean, the thing, the things that we should be talking about more often. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And, and yes, exactly for me, that's what I, I want to shed light on mental illness, but I wa- also want to incite people to look into their own lives. Mm. And uh, everybody's got their own secrets, you right. know, and it's really yes. by shedding light to them that, you know, you can reconnect with a loved one who you haven't spoke to in 10, ten years, you know. Um, you know, just bring us all more together and, and, and try to ameliorate. Well, you know, and everybody because, and, yeah. and, and everybody has a story, right? And everybody yeah. has a story that's important and that needs to be validated and that needs to be infer- affirmed. And maybe maybe somebody maybe you're not gonna make a film about it, but but it's still the the power of our past. The power of, yeah. you know, trying to get a better sense and understand who we are and can can I would I would like to think can only help us in, you know, the steps you know, the steps forward, the, the, the relationships we're going to have. Hey, at what point, or you must have throughout the the making of the film said to yourself, what, what have I done? (laughs) What what have I gotten myself into here? Like this would have been so much easier to make a film about somebody else's mental uh, health issues or somebody else's past. I should have, I should have left mine alone. Absolutely. Yes. And there are these moments of self-doubt. 
you know, and I'm sure every filmmaker with every subject goes through that. But in my case, yes, it was extremely hard because I was exposing my family and uh, I was also afraid. What is my family going to think of this film? And mm. is it going to divide us? You know, that's the last thing that I wanted was for this film to divide us. So um, what I did actually is I tried to involve my brother and my sister, who are the most vulnerable characters in this film. I tried to involve them as much as I could in the creative in the creative process. Sure. Yep. So I would show them like works and work in progress of the the editing and and, oh, and oh, at, cool. at one of the final like um, versions, we sat down and I told them if there's anything you want me to pull out that you're uncomfortable with, just tell me. And fortunately, uh, they were very happy with the film. Um, because they were just happy to share their story. With, they thought it was empowering to share mm. their stories with wow. others. So, so once I got my family's blessing, I started to feel good about it, and I was happy that I had gone through all this process. But yes, like I was saying in the be- beginning, like it, this kind of, you know, it's not easy to find out that your, your father had done horrible things. You know, does that make me a monster? Like, because I have that in my blood, right? Um, But I found that by knowing, I'd be sure that I would do everything I could to never follow my father's footsteps into the darkness, you know? That was kind of like my only key, because if you don't know the past, you there's a big chance that you'll repeat it. Right, right. Well, especially, well, and, and and, and isn't it really all kind of interconnected anyway? You know, the connections of, you know, my, my past probably is going to cross over a little bit with your past and so yeah. on. I mean, the, the anyway, a, a, a interview I did with um, uh, an Indian filmmaker earlier uh, this week and, and just this idea of, you know, continued idea that keeps coming up over and over. Similarity through difference. Yes, you're different. Yes, your story is different. Yes, you live in another part of the world. But you know what? We really are kind of living under the same umbrella. Yeah, definitely. And more and more with like, you know, everything being so connected and, and globalization. Well, this is, a, this is one of the benefits of globalization, it seems to me. People like yourself getting out there telling these stories and, and, and hopefully, you know, more and more people around the world getting to see them. Um, you were 24 when it finally hit you and you said, okay, enough is enough. I've got to figure out what's going on here. Yes. So... So had you at any point up until, you must have been wondering up until you were 24, what was, what was the tipping point for you? Were, was it a relationship you were in? Was it a book you were reading? Was it, was, what was it that said, okay, enough is enough. I need to find out more. So what really, yeah, what really happened is that uh, when I was finishing film school, because I had this dream to make this film about my father, and but the, the trigger uh, was uh, when my sister had her first psychotic episode mm. because my brother had been struggling with bipolar disorder for about seven years. But at that point, his state was really deteriorating. And then my sister experienced her first psychotic episode. And my sister was like, she was my rock. Like, I mm. looked up to my sister. Mm. She um, had played such an important role when I was a teen in helping me find myself. And when I saw her become a completely different person, that like shook me to the core. Right. And I was and, 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 and the, the other thing is like we are four siblings from my father and mother. Right. And that was fifty percent of us that had that were going mad. So that scared me. You know, I could be right. next. Right. I could be next. So I have to know what this illness is about. And uh, I have to try to find ways for this to stop uh, destroying us. Yeah, somebody I think it was your I think it was your sister who talked about being haunted by ghosts. Or by yeah. the, but or by these ghosts, and yeah. you know, and I think what's so beautiful about what you've done and your project and your film and the story that you've told is that it really should, and I hope will act as a challenge to all of us to kind of confront those ghosts, and because we've all got them, right? Yeah. They're all kind of lurking in one way or another. Like you said, we've all got secrets, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was really too, you know, and and we're gonna have to wrap up here in in a second, but but. The, the scene with um, mother-daughter Fatima, is it? Yeah, Fatima, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, is, is kind of heartbreaking. It is. To me in the film. And yet yeah. also really I think, huh, is it, a, is it an affirming challenge to me as well as a parent? But, but it's just, it, 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 it's about, I guess, just being more aware, being sensitive, being able to really listen and to... And, uh, am I am I am I landing anywhere close to what you were hoping for with that scene? Well, yeah. So ultimately, the character of my niece uh, was very fascinating for me because I saw myself in that little girl. Mm. You know, mm. trying yeah, to understand. 
yeah, because I grew up for about five years with my father, and I was trying to understand what he was going through. Right. You know, and so I saw, and 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 then I, I, I you know, and then Fatima is, is is just kind of that proof of 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 that legacy. You know, her, my father was the child who had to go through his father's manic episodes. My sister was that child having to go through my father's manic episodes. And then her own child is stuck in that. So that was really like I could see myself and I could see this vicious cycle. And, and so, I mean, what we're doing now is we're, she's an extraordinarily smart, bright young girl, extremely yeah. sensitive. She <laughs> sure what, seemed like it. Yeah. 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 And she's like the adult. In she, the wasn't, she wasn't fooling around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what we're doing right now is um, we are being very clear with her in terms of what, what happened, what's happening with her mother. Mm. And, and so that it's not a secret. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's a mental illness. We're trying to treat it. And that, you know, if she lives a, a balanced life, she will be fine. So, and we talk about it. I'm very, very open with her about this because we don't want to create a stigma. Right. But uh, essentially, yes, I wanted to expose what it was like for children to experience their parents struggling with mental illness. And when my sister saw that scene, it changed her. Oh, when I she imagine. watched that, it changed her. That's what I really, that is the scene that wow. kickstarted her recovery. Wow. She was like, I can shivers. no, yeah, she was like, I can no longer um, fool myself. You know, mm. I have to get better for mm. my daughter. So, so, uh, so, uh, premiere of your film, world premiere, uh, tonight, uh, April 30th, going to be uh, tomorrow, May 1st, May the 6th, and you're hoping and talking about a theatrical release. Can you talk a little bit, I think I've read, as we wrap up here, I've, I've read a little bit about a virtual reality piece yeah, that you're working absolutely. on. Tell us, tell us a bit more about that. Sure. Um, so yes, right now I'm working on the virtual reality experience. And um, I, because when I was uh, filming, I was in, like in documentary, you're always kind of limited with the, the material that you can um, right. uh, collect, right, out, sure. out in the world. And but so I wanted through the virtual reality to really dwell further into bipolar disorder, to kind of dissect it and to present it to an audience so that they could really understand the arc of the illness. You know, right, I was talking right. earlier about you know uh, hypomania, mania, psychosis, depression. Uh, that was key for me in, in, in understanding how I could help my siblings. So the, the experience is really based on that natural arc of the illness. So these are chapters through which the user will be able to navigate, and the experience is really based on phone calls that I was receiving hmm. from my siblings as I was making the film. So through their testimonies, we understand sort of these landscapes that are building, colliding, hmm. and, and, and falling apart around them. And so the whole experience will be kind of like animated through oil paint-like texture, because both wow. of my siblings are very artistic. My yes. sister paints in the yep. film. So, uh, yeah, essentially the project is to create more awareness and shed light on bipolar disorder and um, sort of the, you know, the, the struggles of people who, who go through this uh, larger-than-life condition. Sounds, sounds marvelous. Sounds beautiful. So I look, I'll look forward to it. Is it, it, will it, will it, be a, is it a Is it an art gallery kind of a thing? Is it going to be in a museum? Will it be, will it be more of a, a traveling experience? Well, it's going to be in a virtual reality festival. Okay. And then we're hoping to release it for the wild, wide, the the wide public. So you'll be able wow. to purchase it on Steam. Wow. Amazing. Or such other platforms. Yeah. Thank you what, so much. What a marvelous, what a marvelous project you've taken on, Kalina. Thank you so much for your 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 time and your generosity today. The film is manic. It's premiering at Hot Docs. Uh, we've been talking with Kalina Bertin about her film. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the time you've you've taken to spend with me today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was a great talk.